Did the earth come into existence through a big bang or was it created by God? Did life evolve slowly over hundreds of millions of years or was it the result of special creation by God? Which is the best explanation of the world we see around us, special creation or evolution? And does it really make any difference? Stay tuned. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope. I am Dave Reagan, Senior Evangelist for Lamb and Lion Ministries. I want you to know that I am really excited about the program that we have for you, not only this week, but for the next few weeks. We're going to present several programs about the important issue of creation versus evolution. And my special expert guest for all three programs is going to be this gentleman, Dr. Job Morton, who is the founder and director of the Biblical Discipleship Ministries located in Rockwall, Texas, a suburb of Dallas. Dr. Martin, we are really happy to have you with us. We're glad to be here, David. We uh, had uh, many years, my wife and I, Jenity, listening to your program, reading your literature. We appreciate that. Well, thank you very much. I'm also glad to have in the studio with me my associate, uh, Nathan Jones, who serves as our web minister. Nathan's on the web uh, every day uh, talking to people all over the world about all kinds of questions. Right, Nathan? Yes, sir. Well, we're glad to have you with us. Oh, hey, it's great. I, I've been using Dr. Martin's materials, uh, Incredible Creatures of Defy Evolution, for years in Bible studies, and I get to actually meet the guy behind the, the video. Well, I know so. that uh, I know you have a special interest in this topic, which is the reason I wanted you to be on here to help us interview Dr. Martin. You know, folks, I first became acquainted with Dr. Martin when one of the trustees of this ministry sent me a book by him. It, it was this book right here. It's entitled The Evolution of a Creationist. I was immediately captivated by the very, very clever title. I began reading the book and I really couldn't put it down. I was blessed by his enthusiasm for his subject and by his thoroughly biblical approach. I was also impressed by the uh, gift of communication the Lord has given him. As you're going to find out in these interviews, he really knows how to explain complex ideas in simple, down-to-earth terms. Now, Dr. Martin, before I ask you some questions about your background so that we can get a feel for your qualifications, I just want to jump right into the topic of evolution versus creation. I want to do it by telling you about an experience I had recently. I was at a church, a very conservative church up in Oklahoma, and uh, I was teaching the combined adult Sunday school classes on Sunday morning, and uh, some question had been asked. I don't remember what it was. And in the process, I just happened to mention offhand that I was a person who believed that the Genesis story meant exactly exactly what it said, that I took it literally, that I believe the earth was created in six literal days about 6,000 years ago. And as I was saying that, a man suddenly just stood up, interrupted me, and said, I am outraged over what you just said. It said, people like you are the ones who make Christians like me look like a moron. He says, anybody knows that science has already proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that the earth is billions of years old, and then you stand up like a moron and say it's only 6,000 years old. How would you have responded to such a person? Have you ever had such an experience? I punch him in the nose. <laughs> <laughs> My kind of guy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's what your flesh wants to do. But well, the spirit, I, I, I suspect you've had a few of these experiences. <laughs> Lots of them. The spirit says, love them. So you love them. You love them. And then it, it depends on how you want to come at it. If, if, if they say they're a Christian, then I'll usually go back and I'll say, okay, you say you're a Christian. Do you believe what the Bible says? And of course I believe what the Bible says. Okay, well then, you say you don't believe in the creation like the Bible describes it. You believe the way evolution describes it. Well, because science has proven it. I'll say, okay, well now, tell me, do you believe in virgin birth? Well, of course I do. Uh, I, and I say, well, you better, because if you don't believe in virgin birth, Jesus inherited a, a, an Adamic sin nature, and he couldn't be the sinless lamb. And I, but I can prove with science that virgin birth doesn't happen in humans. Well, how? Well, we could lock up virgin young ladies for nine months. <laughs> Are they going to come out and have babies? No, absolutely not. Okay, so we can do a scientific experiment that proves virgins don't have babies. But you say you believe in virgin birth. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, because the Bible says so. <laughs> okay, well, then I'll say, well, now, do you believe in resurrection? Well, of course I do. 
Uh, I said, well, you better, because if, if you don't believe in resurrection, you're not going to heaven. It's, if it's appointed. Uh, what's a man supposed to do? Confess with our mouth Jesus as Lord, and believe in your hearts God raised him from the dead, Romans right. 10, 9, that uh, you'll be saved. So resurrection is part of salvation. I said, so you believe in resurrection? Of course. I said, well, I can, I can prove resurrection doesn't happen. Do you want to volunteer? And uh, no, nobody ever volunteers. <laughs> I, I could shoot people dead here. Unless the rapture happens, but I could shoot people dead. They're not going to come popping up. Okay, so I'll say, you believe in virgin birth, you believe in resurrection, we can prove with science, ne neither one of those is going to happen. Then you say, but you don't believe in creation, like the Bible describes it. And, and there is lots of science that really supports the creation idea, just like the Bible presents it. And so I would say probably what's going on here, you love the approval of men more than the approval of God. John 5, 44, John 12, 43. Well, you really believe in going for the juggler, don't you? Well, <laughs> there's no time to waste. The Lord could come soon. Let, let's get busy here. Yes. Dr. Martin, considering science, I hear from Christians all the time that they say carbon dating has proven that the earth is millions of years old and therefore we can't take the uh, creation account as, as valid. What do, you, what do you think about carbon? Is that true? Is carbon dated proven that uh, the world is millions of years old? Well, the carbon-14 question comes up uh, everywhere we go. And on college campuses, mm -hmm. I usually don't say anything about it. And then a student will raise their hand. Well, uh, what about carbon-14? Doesn't that prove things are thousands of years old? Millions or whatever. Yes. Is. And I'll just say to them, well, look, let me ask you a question. Uh, how does Earth's magnetic field affect the formation of carbon-14? And they'll say, huh? <laughs> and I'll say, how yeah. does Earth's magnetic That's field... That's what I was about to say. Yeah, <laughs> affect the formation of carbon-14. And they'll say, what do you mean? I'll say, what I mean is, how does Earth's magnetic field affect the formation of carbon-14? Well, see, there's all kinds of assumptions behind these dating techniques right. that nobody knows anything about. Even the professors don't know about these assumptions. I, eight years in scientific education, I was never taught the assumptions. So there is no evidence scientific evidence, testable evidence hmm. uh, that is provable, that is reproducible, that proves that this universe is billions of years old. And they'll use carbon-14, but it only would work actually for a few hundred years if you want to do it accurately. And it's based upon assumptions such as, one well, of the assumptions is there was never a worldwide flood. Oh, yes, for sure. And if, let's say, there was a water canopy around Earth before yeah. the flood, well, water filters out the kinds of rays right. that would have to get into our atmosphere oh, okay. to make carbon-14. So that would mean before the flood, there would be very little carbon-14 formed. So if they find a bone, and it's organic things they check with carbon-14, if they find a bone and they date it with carbon-14, and they would say, this bone is thousands of years old. Well, maybe not. If there was a canopy and it was a bone from a dinosaur, let's say, that was here before the flood, the bone would not have picked up very much carbon-14. Mm -hmm. So when they measure it, they get a false reading. Weren't they getting readings like snails that were alive that are 27,000 years old and penguins that are 8,000 years old? Yeah, they do. Mammoths where one leg was 44,000 years old and the other leg was only 27,000 years old? The, the dating right. techniques, they're arbitrary. They really are so arbitrary. So basically, if you begin with evolutionary assumptions, you're going to end up with what you want? Well, exactly, exactly. In other words, for instance, like uh, if... If they know the age of a rock, basically, and they test it, uh, you can't trust the, the dates. But if they don't know the age of a rock, let's say billions of years they think it is, and they mm -hmm. test it, then they think they can know what that age is. So like Mount St. Helens, they dated the rocks, they knew how old they were, volcanic rock, and they, and they were up to 3.8 million years dating it. <laughs> but it was only like at that time about 10 years so, <laughs> exactly. Huh. So, I mean, the dating techniques are arbitrary, but they fit within the world view. And so, if you don't believe in God, if you don't believe in the creation, then what are you going to do? You're mm. going to have to find ways to, to try and justify what you think it's going to take to get here, which is billions of years. So, they just take those dating techniques, they publish the figures, they don't tell you the assumptions, like huge assumptions. What they have to assume... That they're, for instance, if they're dating with a technique called car, uh, 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 uranium to lead, if there's any lead in the rock to begin with, their dating technique would be totally wrong. So they just assume there wasn't any lead to begin with. Hmm. Or they assume the rate at which it breaks down has always been the same. 
Well, we know you can speed up and slow down those rates with heat and, and radiation, different things. So, yes, huge assumptions. So, what we both believe by faith in something eternal, whether we're an evolutionist or a creationist, whether we're an atheist or a Christian, we either believe by faith in eternal matter, that would be an evolutionist, or by faith in eternal God. They're both faith-based systems. And it's because you can't prove it. No one was here. You can't do it. Both religions. Yes, you, yeah. can't, you can't duplicate it. Yeah. You can't make Adam from dust again. You can't make the Big Bang go kaboom again, if it ever happened. Dr. Martin, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your background. I know people viewing are saying, okay, now this guy seems to know what he's talking about, but uh, uh, does he have any academic credentials? So uh, tell us a little bit about your background. You didn't start out as a creationist, did you? I sure didn't. Uh, <laughs> well, maybe I did, kind of, but I don't think so. I was raised in the church, Okay. went off to college, Bucknell University, majored in biology and music. Uh, by the time I got out of there, I was an evolutionist. Then I went to dental school. And so when I got out of dental school in 1966, I was agnostic, even though I'd been raised in the church. I didn't know if God existed. I didn't say, didn't exist, atheist. I was looking into Zen Buddhism. This is back in the 60s, the New Age uh, hippie type stuff, you know, which was popular. You, you can remember you those days. You were one days. cool guy here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm an agnostic Zen Buddhist evolutionist. And then uh, I was uh, scheduled to be the dentist for President Johnson's flight crews, Air Force One Presidential Fleet. That was Were you from, in the Air Force at the time? Yes, okay. I was going in the Air Force there, and uh, but I'm in basic training at Wichita Falls, Texas, and uh, and I decided to say a prayer to the God of the Bible. Now I don't know if He's there, but I'm just I'm thinking God of the Bible. So I said, Okay, God, if you're up there, you have two choices: you can either show me the girl I'm going to marry, or you're going to see the wildest Air Force officer you've ever seen. Oh. And uh, Jennedy says he must have been shaking in his shoes. Joke, of course, but. But that's the day I met that's my wife. A prayer. <laughs> yes, I mean, I met my wife on that day, and I knew, oh, I knew I was going to marry her, and I did. Forty-one did you years let ago. Her know that? I did. The very next day, I told oh, her I was going to marry her. I, I didn't ask her to marry me. I just told her I was going to marry her. She didn't run away. She, yeah, but, and she didn't like that at first. But anyway, <laughs> so, but I decided I think the God of the Bible must exist because the very day I prayed that prayer, the day I met Genity. So I got to Washington, D.C., decided I better go to church, walked in the first church I came to. On the way out, the pastor shook my hand, said, Captain, is there anything I could do might help you spiritually? Well, I said, anything you could do would help me spiritually. I'm zero. <laughs> and I was, raised in the church, never read the Bible. All right, according to the Barnard Report, most people that call themselves Christians have never read the Bible all mm -hmm. the way through, even one time. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he asked me to read the Bible, and we read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, not all on the same morning. We got to John 3.16, and that's the verse God brought me into the family. Wow. For God so loved the world. I was wow. part of the world, loved the world. I thought, God loves me. He loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, His name is Jesus, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I put my faith and trust mm. in the Lord Jesus. Then later on, God offered a job, Baylor, on the faculty, and I gave this my first Baylor, Dental Baylor College of Dentistry mm. in Dallas, and I gave my first lecture on the evolution of the tooth. <laughs> I did. I was still an evolutionist now. I went from being an agnostic Zen Buddhist evolutionist to being a theistic evolutionist. I still had God. Now I had God, but I still had the Big Bang and billions of years. I give this lecture how fish scales moved into the mouth, became teeth, and two <laughs> okay. students came up and challenged me after class. I can't believe I believed that, but that's what I was taught. They're still teaching that to fish our kids. Fish scales became teeth? Fish scales became teeth. Yep. I'm calling up there, huh? They, they, yes, yes. <laughs> There's no relationship between scales and teeth, whether you look at it anyway. So they challenged me, and I said, well, okay, let's study creation science. I'm thinking, cocky, rookie, professor, you know, I'll wipe these guys out. What are they, where are they coming from? I became a literal, biblical creationist. Took a while. But I believed what the Bible said. We studied the assumptions the evolutionists made, and we also looked at creatures. Now, the first one was a bombardier beetle. Maybe we can talk about that yeah. sometime. But anyway, so that was kind of the progression of things. And then uh, I resigned my professorship. I was a full professor with tenure at the dental school and went to Dallas Theological Seminary. Wow, that was a big step of faith. Well, it was. Mm -hmm. I think the Lord, he, he just worked it out. So that was just the thing to do. And my family agreed, so that's what we did. And since 1986, we've been having this ministry. And so you're a man with a scientific background in biology and dental uh, medicine. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you have um, some credentials to be talking about this. Well, I sure came up through the system. Okay. And I've been on all sides of the fence. 
Well, how about looking right into this camera here and telling folks how they can get in touch with your ministry? Probably the easiest way to get in touch with us would be through our, we have two web pages. One is the World Wide Web, biblicaldiscipleship.org.org, and the other one is evolutionofacreationist.com. So those two have most of what we do. And through those websites, can they sign up to be on your newsletter mailing list? On the uh, evolutionofacreationist.com, uh, I believe we post our, uh, our uh, what, monthly letter, okay. bi- bi-monthly letter. And then you can also uh, get uh, books and publications, uh, videos uh, through that website? Yes, uh, most everything. And we have an email address and things And if too. people are interested in having you come and speak at the church or some group, they can contact you through that website? Uh, they can. Okay. And it's, uh, we just go. We're free. Okay. And where, are you, where is your ministry located? It's in Rockwall, Texas, just outside of Dallas, Texas. Okay. So... Um, I hope that people will uh, contact you because I tell you, you have a wonderful ministry with tremendous resources. And as they have already seen in this program, you're a very effective communicator. I still like your answer to that question. Just poke him in the mouth. (laughs) (laughs) You do feel like that. Grab him and shake him. (laughs) Okay. Well, we'll be back in just a moment. But first, we're going to um, give some uh, uh, our viewers an opportunity to see how they can get one of your resources. And then we'll come back. We're just bubbling over with questions. The book, The Evolution of a Creationist, is a layman's guide to the conflict between the Bible and evolutionary theory. Author Dr. Job Martin shares that while on the faculty of Baylor College of Dentistry, he was challenged by his students to study the little-known assumptions of the theory of evolution. This book chronicles his personal journey from traditional evolutionist to a creationist. Dr. Martin's scientific and medical training was revolutionized as he studied animals that challenged the scientific assumptions of his education. The Evolution of a Creationist takes a look at animals that break all the evolutionary rules. Dr. Martin presents 10 marvels of God's creation. The bombardier beetle, the incubator bird, the garden spider, the gecko lizard, the giraffe, the anglerfish, the beaver, the chicken egg, the chuckwalla lizard, and the woodpecker. It examines the many problems with evolutionary theory and shows why the Bible is an excellent book of science. This book can be yours for a gift of $15 or more. Shipping is free of charge. To get a copy, visit landline.com and look for product number P72. Welcome back to our studio and our special guest, Dr. Job Martin, who is the founder of Biblical Discipleship Ministries and is an expert on the issue of evolution versus creationism. And I have also with me one of our staff members here, Nathan Jones, who is the uh, web minister for our ministry. Uh, Dr. Uh, Martin, I'd like to pick up where we left off and uh, you're talking about your background. Now, you said you had some students at the Baylor Medical uh, School, the Baylor uh, Dental School, who challenged you about the idea that fish scales became teeth <laughs> because you were an evolutionist at that time. Yes. And you said you began to study the issue. Yes. And I compliment you on that because there are many people who would have such closed minds, they wouldn't do it. But you did begin to study. What was it that convinced you, that, that moved you from being an evolutionist to a creationist? Well, three things. Number one, I'm studying my Bible because I'm a baby Christian, basically. Okay. So I'm reading my Bible and studying the Bible, seeing what God says. Then the students asked me to look at the assumptions that the evolutionists made, which I was never taught, and they're still not teaching our kids. And, and what's that? Like you read their original articles, like Libby, the fellow invented carbon-14, and he'll say, I think this, we believe this, we posit this, perhaps this. Those are the assumptions. Hmm. And I began to realize these assumptions, they aren't valid. They, ju- they aren't valid at all. They aren't true. And then we're looking at some animals. I was a biology major, and I don't know where these fellas came up with it, but they brought this bombardier beetle to me one day, and they said, uh, well, Dr. Martin, let's, let's study this little bug, see if you think it can evolve, and how could it evolve? And it's a little bug that shoots fiery hot gases out of twin tail tubes, and it would blow itself up every step of the way. If It needed all of its parts. It, it doesn't have uh, things in separate sacks or something, and they combine together and heat to 212 degrees or something? Yeah, like? Exactly right, yes. And so it's shooting these... Sounds like it ought to blow up. <laughs> it would if it didn't have all its parts. I mean, it needs like the combustion chamber, 
Uh, but even if it had that and mixed these chemicals so that this violent reaction happens, if it didn't have the twin tail tubes to shoot it out, it'd still blow itself up. And so I began to realize these things are irreducibly complex. You know, our kids do fractions and they reduce them down and can't reduce them down anymore. And that's like this little bug. It needed all of its parts. You, you couldn't have a partially evolved uh, <laughs> cannon. Or, you know, uh, it's going to blow up the bug. So yeah, so it had to have been made complete, mature, fully functional. And so I began to think, well, look, God is telling me he made everything. He did it in six days. He did it just a short time ago, about 6,000 years ago. And then I look at this and I say, well, there's no way it could evolve. Billions of years couldn't produce that. It, it would be dead. Survival of the fittest, it wouldn't work. And, well, if God created that little bug, and, uh, and it needed a God to create it, there's no way it could evolve all its parts at one time. Well, then why not a God to create everything? And that's what really got me thinking. Well, you know what? I think I can trust that Bible. Now I know I can trust it. Nathan? Would you say then... Uh, because it sounds like the bombardier beetle was the thing that was really changed your mind. What do you say then is the greatest argument for special creation? Is it complexity of nature or something else? Well, I think the greatest argument for special creation is the Bible. Hmm. Uh, what does it say? If we call ourselves a Christian, we should look at the Bible and just take what it says. And that's what it teaches. It teaches creation. Now, if, praise God, there's other evidences that come in. And uh, there's huge weaknesses with the evolution side of thing, but we're, we're never taught those things. All right, let me play the devil's advocate here now for a moment. You say the Bible. Okay. I would respond, to, and I know how people respond to this. They mm -hmm. say, okay, first of all, the Bible is not a science book. It's a book about God's relationship with man and this sort of thing. But it's certainly not a science book. So we can't go to the Bible to find anything that's scientific. Uh, how do you respond to that? Well, first of all, the Bible is a science book. When uh, it deals with things that have to do with science, mm -hmm. it, it's not exhaustive. It doesn't tell us everything, but what it does tell us is true. And when it tells us, for instance, God made the heavens and the earth, He did it within a six-day week, well, that's science. What, what, what do the evolutionists say? Well, their science says it was billions of years. So they can't say, if we talk about days, that's not science. And if they talk about billions of years, that is science. <laughs> uh, th there's contradictions there. Yeah. So, well, isn't the Bible full of a lot of uh, revelations that science discovered later on? Like, people talk about, uh, for example, uh, people would say that anybody believes in a uh, special creation in six days would probably believe in a flat earth. They always call us flat earth people. Flatter, yeah. But the Bible teaches that the earth is a circle, right? It does. Isaiah chapter 40. It's and the hydraulic system is in the Bible. It is. I mean, it's, uh, uh, it, there's one scientific system after another that is revealed in the Bible. In fact, one that comes to my mind is Paul says over in Romans that uh, all of creation is in bondage to decay. He wrote that in the first century. It wasn't until what? The 19th century that science discovered the uh, second law of thermodynamics that yes. says the same thing? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, he, he said all kinds of things that there's no way he could know. Like in 1 Corinthians 15, I think it's verse 39, he says there are these different kinds of flesh. One flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another flesh of birds, another flesh of fish. They just discovered that in my lifetime. At the cytoplasmic level of the cell, there are basic different kinds of flesh. Yeah. 2,000 years ago, God's apostle, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said, look, there's these different kinds of flesh. So, yes. Okay, now this mm -hmm. brings me to a, a point that you make in your book over and over. And I think it's one of the fundamental points you make, and that is... We're not talking here about faith versus science. We're talking about one kind of faith versus another kind of faith. Aren't you saying that even scientists are operating in faith? Yes. It, it, Elaborate that point for well, me. Well, you have to decide where do we start. And so scientists that don't believe in the Bible, they believe in evolution, they start somewhere. <laughs> uh, they start with a Big Bang, usually. As a matter of fact, if you would ask them, what was here before the Big Bang? I've done that on campuses. And they'll say, we don't ask that question. Oh. So they believe by faith in their system. Now that takes a lot of faith to believe that an explosion can create order. I've never seen an explosion do anything but create chaos. You think about that. Yes, order, regularity, symmetry, beauty, predictability, all those things. 
no explosion produces those things. That's a big leap of faith right there. I believe it. I believe it is. Yes, <laughs> it, it is. It reminds me of Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Yeah. And that is faith. Yeah. That's the definition of religion. And evolutionists work just like Christians on that belief in something they don't see. Yes, and, and we hear people all the time saying, well, we can't have a religious viewpoint taught in the public schools. We, we have to have a scientific viewpoint. But really, the <clears throat> scientific viewpoint of evolution is a type of faith. It is a type of religion. It isn't is. It? Exactly. The government is dictating in the school system. Well, sure. It is a total world view, and all world views are based on a religious system. Yes. And, and the thing that underlies and, and is the foundation of their religious system is the idea of evolution. And they have to have that if they decide there is no God. And, you know, as a person who grew up in education, I, I taught at the university level for 20 years before I went into ministry. Uh, it just really upsets me when I see these people absolutely demand that no alternative viewpoint be presented because the essence of education is you look at all the viewpoints, the evidence for all the viewpoints, and try to decide which is the best one. It's not a matter of propaganda. It's a matter of education is not propaganda. Oh. And what they're wanting is propaganda. Exactly right. All we're asking for is equal time. Exactly. They're a priesthood. And why they're the is, priesthood of their own religion. Yes. Why are they mm -hmm. so afraid? If, if they are so confident that their view is correct, why are they so frightened of even having somebody exposed to an alternative viewpoint? That's, that, is, that is true. In other words, they know. For instance, debates on the campuses where you'll have a creationist versus an evolutionist. The evolutionist loses every time where they won't even debate us anymore. And so it's like they know. They have a faith-based system, and they don't want anybody bringing up any questions about it. Well, one of the things that uh, is fascinating to me is how the whole evolutionary field has retreated in recent years uh, to the point of saying, well, yeah, there's his design, but tell you what, it came from outer space. There's some aliens came and planted life here on this planet. Richard I mean, Dawkins that's how desperate that they are in the now. movie Expelled. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. And we're going to get yeah. into more about that when we talk about the impact of DNA and things of that. Now, I tell you, we've got so many questions to ask you. And <laughs> that's why we're going to have to do, I, I think we're going to have to do more than three programs. We're going to have to probably do four programs to cover all the things. Yeah. And even then, there'll be, we'll only be touching the hem of the garment. That's why yeah. people need to get a copy of your book, because it uh, is rather compre uh, comprehensive in nature. Well, folks, that's our program for this week. I hope it's been a blessing to you, and I hope you'll join us again next week when Dr. Martin will once again be our special guest. Next week, Nathan and I plan to ask Dr. Martin a long list of questions about creation versus evolution, questions that I know you will find interesting because they've been sent in by you, our viewers. For example, I plan to start off by asking him if evolution is a proven fact or just a theory. I then plan to ask him what he considers to be the weakest aspect of evolutionary thought. Additionally, we're going to get into a discussion of the relationship between creationism and Bible prophecy. Believe it or not, there is such a relationship. And folks, please tell your friends about the program and urge them to gather their children around their TV set and computer and tune in. Our children are constantly bombarded with the lies of evolution. Let's expose them to the truth of what the Bible has to say about our origins. Thank you, Nathan. Folks, that's our program for this week. Until next week, the Lord willing, this is Dave Reagan speaking for Lamb and Lion Ministries saying, look up, be watchful, for our redemption is drawing near. Thank you for joining us on today's Christ in Prophecy, a presentation of Lamb and Lion Ministries, a non-denominational ministry dedicated to teaching the fundamentals of biblical prophecy and proclaiming the soon return of Jesus.